The Dalai Lama once said that today, more than ever before, life must be characterized by a sense of universal responsibility, not only nation to nation and human to human, but also human to other forms of life. Join me in conversation with some of the world's most creative thinkers to explore the importance of ethics to this responsible decision-making in today's technologically infused world. Artists, entrepreneurs, scientists, journalists, academics, and beyond navigate the gray, the blend of right and wrong, of opportunities and risks on all sides of our most important challenges, whether gene editing, civilian space travel, or artificial intelligence. They also probe the age-old and more ethically black and white behaviors, such as sexual misconduct, human trafficking, and life-threatening inequality. Our guests endeavor to transcend religious, political, national, and ethnic perspectives, but recognize the inevitable biases we all bring. The term ethics can make us uncomfortable. At the Ethics Incubator, we confront the E-word head-on. It may be inconvenient or even unclear, but ethical conundrums underpin almost every headline and affect almost every human choice. With truth under threat and the boundaries of humanity blurring, I believe that ethical decision-making tethers us to our humanity. As always, we welcome your thoughts. My distinguished guest today, Claudia Rankin, needs no introduction. She's a Yale professor, the winner of MacArthur Fellowship, a Guggenheim Fellowship, and so many other awards that if I were to list them all, uh, we would use up all of our interview time. She has written a number of wonderful works, most recently, Just Us, an American Conversation that came out on September 8th and will be the subject of the interview, in addition to her renowned work, The White Cart. Claudia also co-founded the Racial Imaginary Institute, TRII. I recommend you have a look at it on the website. It's an extraordinary combination and curation of different artists' views through the lens of imagination on racism. So Claudia, very warm welcome and thank you so much for doing this. Let me start with congratulations. On September 8th, my Kindle found its way to your wonderful new work, Just Us, an American Conversation. The hard copy is just so beautiful. You have the penguin and this is the Grey Wolf version. It's a photograph by Nona Fastine. Before we dig into that particular work, and I'd also like to discuss the white card a little bit, can we just start with a foundational question about how did you find your way to poetry and to writing? How did you find your own ethical foundation or your own true North? I think um, first, I want to say I'm glad you're doing well in this very strange time that we're in. Um, I think poetry for me, beginning college where I seriously began to study it, was always a place where I could find the unsaid. There are the facts and there are the communicate, what is communicated. And then there's a whole nother realm where you're dealing and interacting and encountering others. And it seems to exist below language, but then poetry has a way of being able to enter into not the words, but the dynamic through the words. And it's more a sense of process than a sense of showing. So I was, that's how um, my interest in poetry began. It, it seemed to answer questions that weren't answered in other places. Well, and it also, I mean, and, and we'll get into to these works more specifically, but somehow you, you make us feel as if we're there and we sort of can't quite figure out how it's happening to us. <laughs> and, and, and yet we're sort of transported into a, a very different kind of understanding and not, not sort of being told, this is what you should be learning. What about your own sort of ethics foundation, your own true north? Do you have a something in your upbringing is some writers you follow or some sort of personal guide where you figure out your your guiding principles and ethics the guiding principles have come through writers in an odd way that poets like paul salon and and not exactly through what they write but how they write it I mean, somebody like Paul Salon after um, Shoah, uh, you know, the devastation of the Holocaust, he, he 
literally changed his writing so that it would be impossible for you to read without understanding that people are shattered. And he did that by referring to an arm or a leg or an eye doing this or doing that. And so you couldn't take the whole body as one thing. And that, that kind of writer has helped me to think about what the encounter is, how you and I are only important in our interaction with each other. And, and, and obviously people like Levinas, who talks about the I-Thou connection, have been important. Affect theorists have been very important to me in terms of thinking about what the encounter is. And the discipline of poetry is a discipline about close reading, which is about listening and understanding what is happening between us in, in not necessarily what is being explicitly communicated, but implicitly asked. And those, that's, those are the kinds of things that have allowed me to kind of ground myself. So from there, when I, when I look at this word conversation in your title, one of the things I was trying to figure out for myself is what does this mean and how do we have better conversations and how do we navigate this interaction that you're talking about? But if I can start with this idea that comes out in your works about being seen and how we all need to be seen, but we don't necessarily do a great job of seeing each other or making other people feel seen. And there's this line from the white card when Charlotte, the artist says, I do want people to experience what black people are feeling, or if that's unreasonable at the very least to recognize what it means to live precariously. There are other moments in Just Us where the, I, I feel that it's very much about this notion of being seen. How can conversations help us? How can we do a better job of seeing each other and, and making ourselves seen? Literally listening is seeing. There's a quote in Just Us that talks about, um, it's by, I think, Lauren Ballant. And she talks about how we have to really begin to start thinking and, and that we're an automatic pilot. And I think that kind of automatic default way of being in the world prevents us from hearing what is being said to us and seeing the person who's saying it. So I think it really calls for a kind of slowing down. George Floyd's murder by um, Chauvin this summer I, I think that part of the reason it has had the impact it's had is because people were home. They weren't sort of everywhere. And they were able to hear him when he said, I can't breathe. And when he called out to his mother who was already dead, so you knew that he was already in this non-space of moving on. And, and I think the, the opportunity we have had during the quarantine is actually to be still for a moment. And, and to be able to listen and hear and to see the impact of what, what language mm -hmm. is communicating. Because of this slowing down, there was a sense of also how long it is taken to get that kind of notice. You also talk about, there's some, this idea of negotiating, negotiating stereotypes before us. You bring up in, in Just Us uh, a friendship. And it seems at one moment that you're trying to sort of negotiate your friend's reaction in a you know when you're at the theater and your and your friend's reaction to different things and sort of negotiating these issues with a white friend of yours can you talk a little bit about what negotiation means in the context of good conversations or conversations that get to where you would like us to be with each other without negotiation it means that i expect to move from a to b without your considering you mm -hmm. And the minute you enter, you enter with a whole nother set of um, experiences, needs, things to communicate to me. And so I, I think we always have to, if we're interested in the person we're with, we're always swerving and making accommodations in order to make um, a conversation, build something between us. And so without, without those kinds of negotiations, you're not building anything. You're not creating a space. And to, to, to not 
be willing to be flexible, to listen, to, to respond to the next thing is to abdicate your role inside that conversation. The piece that you refer to, Ethical Loneliness, um, my friend, we go to see the play. The play literally in its last moment says to the people in the audience, will the white people get up from their seat and stand on stage so that the people of color can have the space of the audience to themselves and enact something that does not happen in real life? Will you give them this space? And the white woman that I attended the play with did not move and did not move and refused to move. <laughs> and I found myself just enraged by her inability to practice mm -hmm. a kind of sharing of space, just to practice it. Mm -hmm. And um, so that piece um, is, is addressing that my own rage and her um, refusal. But I have to say, as a reader, we felt the rage also. We felt it, we, it was almost like trying to pull somebody who was physically stuck to a seat. I just wanted to sort of yank her out of the seat and or, or sort of say, wake up. Are you not seeing what's going on here? And then I was going back to myself and saying, how many times do I need to wake myself up that I might not have woken myself up? So it was an extremely powerful experience for the reader. One of the things you do so masterfully in this book is let us watch you in these conversations and share your, you know, we're, we're standing in line at uh, the airport with you and we're sitting on a plane while you don't get served drinks and somebody next to you gets two and has to speak up for you. And I watched an earlier interview you did where you said you had a discussion with your publisher about not wanting your picture on the back of a book and sort of not wanting to put yourself into it. And I was just wondering, how did you make the decision about how you put yourself in this book and it's just so wonderful. But I, I'm just wondering sort of when, uh, what went into your thinking? Why that decision? Yes. In all of the other books, there, you know, Citizen was built on interviews. Mm -hmm. It was a book that um, I interviewed many people and then wrote Citizen. The, with this book, I, the thing that I realized in Citizen is when I take your story, when I talk to you, and I can't then build an interior life for you without um, crossing a boundary that I'm not comfortable crossing. Because um, you'll later say, but I wasn't thinking of that. I, I didn't, that's, that's not exactly right, Claudia. And so in order to do just us, I, I, I thought, you know, Claudia, you, you, I am going to have to be in there. I, in order to build the interior life of the person who is, who is part of this interaction, it's, it has to be you. Or, um, well, it's, it's absolutely wonderful. And at the same time, we're conscious of the fact that we can't know what it feels like to be you, mm -hmm. but it's just wonderful to be led into that. But I have a very similar issue when I'm doing ethics advisory work or even teaching, which is that I always tell people, I don't tell anybody what to do. For among other reasons, I'm not going to be the one walking in the shoes and living out the consequences of the decisions. So I can help people structure thinking. I can help open eyes, listen better, et cetera understand what's at stake in complicated ethical questions, but I'm not going to be the one with living with the consequences, so I don't make decisions for other people. I'm glad you say that because one of the criticisms um, Justice has had yeah. is what's the solution where, you know, you, this book doesn't tell us what to do. And, you know, I'm like, I never intended to tell you what to do. I intended to show a process that you can enter and, and, and to give the book as much openness for you to go where you need to go to think about these things. Mm -hmm. But it's not, it's not a prescription. But even in the white card, I mean, just to, to finish this topic of how we have the conversation and negotiating and taking responsibility for your role in the conversation, that wonderful line about, I think Charlotte says it towards the end of, why don't you make you your project? I think we need to be, as you say, kind of accommodating the other person in the conversation. And at the same time, we need to be ever so more mindful of ourselves and that these issues are not about someone else. They're not somebody else's problem. We're all in this. We're all creating this. In Robin D'Angelo's terms, we're all part of this system. But I thought that was just a wonderful line. We're, mm -hmm. we're all running around making everybody else the project. And it says, there's a, there, I think white people go around thinking there's racism without racists, you know? And right. 
And you're like, how, how is that possible? No. And the idea that some people don't think that they are susceptible of unconscious bias or, you know, I mean, that's just absurd. We're all human. I like to think about racism as institutionalizing the violence of bias. I can say, Susan, I don't like your dress, mm -hmm. but that's not going to prevent you from getting a job, from going and moving and having mobility in this right. world. But if you say to me, I don't believe black people are capable of X or Y thing, and you end up on a job committee, that will impact my ability to get a job. Yeah. So I think about bias as, as sort of whatever, but racism has the backing of the institutions exactly. and yeah. the government. And the only way to address it is institutionalizing solutions. Mm -hmm. exactly. um, so I'd like to pick up another thing that I found fascinating, which, which is this idea of the past. In the white card, this idea of, of Charlotte trying to recapture the past, but also in Just Us, you, you refer a number of times to memory and Toni Morrison and this idea of remembering, putting back together things that were dismembered or Ta-Nehisi Coates and reparations. And one of the things that I'm particularly interested in is that we're in the midst of this epidemic of compromised truth of just disrespect for the truth. And I look at that and I say, from an ethics standpoint, that means that tomorrow's memories are gonna be distorted and history is gonna be distorted. And then all the people like Eli Wiesel or Malala Yousafzai who've said, don't forget, we can't learn from history if we're forgetting. It sort of all came together for me when Charlotte says it seems like American pastimes are football and forgetting. And I'm just wondering how you, how we deal with this forgetting and how we make sure we don't forget and how we sort of as a, to the, the George Floyd example, how do we get moving more quickly? Why does it take so many decades? It has taken the decades it's taken because people don't want to make the adjustments that come with the knowledge. Mm -hmm. So I think that's intentional. I don't think that it's a, a, an inability to metabolize the facts. It's, it's if the facts come with a need for change, that's a very different thing. We're talking about sharing resources if we're talking about creating equity. Mm -hmm. And you can't create equity and leave what is as it is. Mm -hmm. And that, so that I think is willful um, forgetting, not. <laughs> So, you know, my question right now is when this election is over and hopefully Biden-Harris arrive in office, will people believe that the way things are belong to Trump or belong to America? I, I, that's my biggest fear, that they think that the outsetting of Trump is going to take away the kind of systemic racism that exists inside this country. And, and the misogyny that exists inside this country. So I, I'm, I'm curious about that, um, how that will work itself out. Well, I mean, it comes back to what I was saying um, about democratizing ethics. It should be accessible to everybody. Everybody should have a voice on these issues, but everybody has responsibility. Exactly. This is not, this is not one person. And honestly, we would have been able to mitigate some of the damage of one person. It's the Senate, it's the executive, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a system. Can I ask you a little bit about this notion of curation that comes up? Uh, it obviously comes up in the white card. In Just Us, it feels like you've done this beautiful job of curating different episodes, different experiences for us. But right now we have this epidemic of social media curation. And I might call it many other things. I might call it self-censorship. I might call it erasing the inconvenience. I might call it downright misleading, but there are many aspects of this that worry me a great deal because again, I come back to this, this willingness to distort the truth or cherry pick the convenient truths. And I'm just wondering, are you at all worried outside the arts where curation has a particular purpose and a particular beauty uh, and messaging? Are you worried about the kind of so-called curation that's happening on social media and in society more generally? I'll put it this way. I. I think there are abuses that happen on social media, but I think it's what happens when things become, in a sense, democratized. Abuse comes with it. So there is, it's not an encyclopedia. You cannot go to it and trust it. But what it has allowed us 
is the ability to create news where we didn't have that power before. There have been benefits for having open platforms and there have been you know, deep negatives to having that. Um, and, and so nothing that I find on social media do I use without checking. But I wouldn't have known about Philandro Castile without social media. I wouldn't have known about Michael Brown. You know, I wouldn't have seen so much that I have seen without the democratizing of, of, of that part. No, I think it's, it's gonna be interesting to see what happens over generations. It's gonna be closed down. I think people won't have as much access as they do now. Well, that's an interesting point. And also, I mean, it's, it comes back to what you were saying about taking time and being still. Social media is not conducive to patience mm -hmm. and to longer conversations and to reflection before writing, et cetera. So I think it's gonna be interesting to see where that goes. Just a few more questions, if I may. You use this word liminal a lot in Just Us, and it's a very powerful word. It's a little bit scary. It's a little bit unsettling. Can you talk about that word and, and what it means in conversations and what it means for our, all of our learning? Liminal spaces are spaces that are outside um, the, the here and the there. You know, I start here and I go there, but in the middle, I'm in these non-spaces that are not committed to this or that. Mm -hmm. And I was interested in, in using those spaces to create conversation that don't actually live in the normal course of our lives. So what can I get if I go in the margin? Mm -hmm. Bell Hooks talks about the margins as a space of radical openness. And so for me, liminal spaces became spaces of radical openness where I could explore things that in other spaces people didn't have time for or, you know, were just on a different agenda. But I found it fascinating because I'm always very interested in spaces of discomfort also, where we don't exactly know where we are and some of the standard reference points don't necessarily apply. And I actually, I say to my very edgy ethics classes, I, I say at the beginning, get used to this mucking around in uncertainty because that's what we're going to be doing for the term. So I thought that was fantastic, but also because there is so much uncertainty around how do we make progress? Where do we go from here? There's, I don't know if you've seen it, but I see all the time, especially with students, fear. Am I going to say the wrong thing? Even if I'm well-intentioned, am I going to offend somebody? How do I navigate that fear? Is that something that is of concern to you? It is definitely on the table right now. Everybody is a little bit jumpy about saying the wrong thing and doing the wrong thing. But in my classroom, I often find that keeping everything transparent has helped me. I just say, look, we, we are in the space of education to experiment. So this is an arena in which we can say things and we will make mistakes. And, and everybody in this classroom should feel free to question whatever they feel they need to question. Question it is not to shut it down. Right. It's to question it. Right. And so if we put those possibilities out there at the get-go, it, it sort of opens up conversations. I mean, I still, I, I'm not saying that my classroom is the ideal classroom. I'm sure students walk away feeling like she's too um, liberal. I can't bring up, you know, my, my religious conservativeness without feeling a little bit targeted. So, you know, they're, they're that I've seen that happen in the class only because it has been brought up. And then you're, you're sort of asking different kinds of questions. We, we as educators can't be fearful. No, I completely agree. I think we need to sort of say, this is a place for courage. And as you say, experimentation, this is a place for assuming good faith also. Mm -hmm. I mean, unless I get evidence that somebody is a sort of a repeat offender and really demonstrate exactly. bad faith. But this is a place where we assume good faith. And this is a place where everybody, my hand up first, we all say things that don't come out quite the way we wish they had. And we all need to have an opportunity to sort of backtrack and say, I'm sorry, let me rephrase. Mm -hmm. um, and also keep it in the classroom. This is something yes. I often find interesting that people will decide to, and this comes up in Just Us, that they decide to take that person out in the hallway to save face. But I don't think it's a question of saving face because I don't know who 
has been impacted by what has been said. So for me, I always feel like, let's keep it in this room. Let's, yeah. let's all go there. If one of us is going there, let's all go there. No, absolutely, absolutely. Also, there is too much taking things out in terms of you know, social media or sort of disrespecting the privacy of a conversation in a classroom mm -hmm. and, and all of those things for all the good they may do are one big example of taking things out of context. Yeah, and it just spreads like wildfire. Let me ask you one final question, if I may, which is sort of outside the realm of the racism that you uh, explore in your work. What are what is the ethical question facing society today that worries you most at this time? And I don't know if this is an ethical question, but the thing that has been on my mind and that has been worrying me is how do we grieve nationally? I really worry that we have in this country over 200,000 people who have lost loved ones. We have people who have lost jobs. We have people who are in precarious situations around um, rent or mortgage or all kinds of things. And I don't know when I'm talking to somebody, when I encounter somebody, how they're really doing mm -hmm. and how they've been impacted by the last six, seven months, nine months. And, and so I don't even know how to start that conversation with you or with a larger group of people. And we have, because we have no leadership on the top, there has been no mechanisms put in place for grieving as a country. There are so many aspects of it. One that I, I've been particularly grappling with is the arbitrariness of it all is we don't know this disease affects different people differently. And there can be some generalizing about age groups or certain kind of preconditions, but there are so many examples of people who are just randomly terribly affected mm -hmm. and, and terribly affected in other ways. I mean, yes, psychologically, yeah. Disproportionate impact on certain communities, psychological impact, somebody who's put their heart and soul building a small business for 30 years and it's gone overnight. And I think we haven't, we haven't learned how to have a national conversation because as you say, we don't have a leader who to come back to our earlier topic is really interested in seeing people and really interested in getting in and having the conversation or leading the conversation. Exactly, and how do we show up for each other in yeah. this moment when not everything can be addressed legislatively? I think that there's a new ask on the American population but I don't even know what the bridge is or what the mechanism is for showing up for people. Do they even know to ask? Is there something I could be doing for another person if they were had a mechanism to tell me that they needed a thing? People don't know how to ask. They don't know where to ask. Like all of these questions, there are people for whom it are factors of shame mm -hmm. or privacy. And, and so it just becomes impossible to sort of expose oneself. I mean, the only sort of the first step I've taken is to say benefit of the doubt, no matter what situation I am, am I navigating an institution where I don't know whether somebody really feels comfortable coming to work? Am I navigating student situations? You know, we're all on Zoom and we're seeing everybody's worlds, giving everybody the benefit of the doubt that we just don't really know what's going on behind the scenes. But at some point it, it's gonna be really critical to understand, as you say, how do we have this national conversation and how do we grieve? But Claudia, your work is extraordinary and I learned so much from it. Thank you. Um.